In this lecture, we're going to look at um, the shear stress distribution in an I section, but instead of using um, the uh, shear stress where we're looking at a shear coming vertically down, uh, we're going to use it uh, with the shear flow that we've um, we've learned before. So the I section we have here is actually one that we've already uh, worked out the shear stress distribution with. So it's a uh, a 400 millimeter tall by 150 millimeter wide uh, section, steel section, I section, and it's got a 80 kilonewton uh, shear load applied. And then uh, there are the section properties for you. So the, the Y bar is at 200 millimeters up from the bottom. And the moment of inertia is uh, 2.75 times 10 to the eighth millimeters to the fourth. So uh, just to refresh uh, your memory, so when we've previously uh, looked at what the shear stress distribution is on this section uh, in a previous lecture. Uh, let's say we'll go previously. We found uh, our shear stress distribution to be and we'll just uh, Draw our section, our little I section here again. Um, and if this was our centroid, well, our distribution um, look like This and the the values here uh, again. These are all coming off of a, a previous video, uh, 1.10 MPA, 11.1 uh, .1 MPA, tau max equals 15.8 MPA, and again this is symmetric about the neutral axis. 11.1, 1.10 MPA, and uh, what we what we discussed is really the the problem with uh, this shear stress distribution is in the flanges where um, because we've got um, you know we have a free edge here uh, at the top well we can't have uh, 1.10 uh, megapascal of stress there because we need to have zero stress at a uh, at a free edge. So what we want to do is we want to reanalyze this section uh, using what we've learned uh, with um, shear flow. So let's reanalyze using shear flow and remember our shear flow is just uh, lowercase q now let's just move that out of there uh, for a second uh, just lowercase q equals a v times uppercase q divided by I uh, for thin walled open sections. So uh, in, again, what are we what are we looking at here? So uh, let's just sort of draw our, our no numbers uh, distribution uh, just to kind of get a, a feel for what we're looking at. So if you remember from our shear flow video, this is our flanges. That's our web. Our shear stress distribution, or our shear flow distribution, and then a, a stress we can just divide by uh, the thickness. Uh, look like this, where we 
you know, we had our shear flow coming into the middle. Uh, and we'll call that value just uh, QA. Um, and then uh, we'll just draw this out here. And that's our shear stress distribution, and that's going to be uh, pointing down. Uh, there'll be some, you know, Q max. There'll be some, uh, we'll call that Q B. And then uh, down at the bottom, uh, going out the other direction, is again Q A. So. Um, just uh, a, a quick sort of, you know, sanity check before we um, we go through our our um, determining our shear stress distribution. So shear flow. Remember, shear flow is all um, going to be in uh, newtons per millimeter. So you can think about um, it's sort of millimeters into uh, into the page. So when when we looked at the examples. Uh, in the homework for shear flow, uh, remember we were looking at sort of nails uh, and, and nailed sections here, and we're looking at the the shearing uh, of um, you know it's the web and the flange moving uh, in and out of the page relative to each other. Now that's going to be the same for what our shear is going vertically because or you know, in the case of the flange is going horizontally, because as we've shown, if you've got longitudinal shear, you're gonna have transverse shear, which you're also going to have to resist. Um, again, other, other rules that we remember uh, from our shear flow video, if, you, if we're loading, um, so we've got a symmetric section here, if we're loading about uh, a plane of symmetry, um, any uh, element which is going to be perpendicular to that, to that uh, load, uh, the shear flow is going to vary uh, linearly, and any uh, section which is parallel is going to vary parabolically. Uh, and so for uh, an open section, that becomes, well, if you're horizontal, it's going to be linear, and if you're vertical, it's uh, going to be... Um, uh, parabolic so for an open section for one where you've got a, a load uh, along a line of symmetry. This is not the case if we have uh, an asymmetric section, which you'll uh, or a, a section where we're not lay, uh, loading on the principal axis. So if you had a uh, like a Z section uh, and we load it down here, if you remember from your principal axes, well they're about they they move in this uh, sort of direction. Um, we wouldn't have this distribution. So, um, but for for the cases we're going to look at uh, in this class, it's going to be sort of I section, C sections, or or something of that uh, nature. Um, this is going to work where if you have um, shear flow, uh, equals zero uh, at free edge. Um, and then if element is um, horizontal, Q varies linearly. if element is vertical, Q varies parabolically. And remember, this is only the case if your loading is in the direction of the principal axes. So like I said, it doesn't work for this, um, you know, Z um, shape over here, but it will work for an I section. So um, that's our, our quick sort of, of wrap. Um, 
And uh, I think one more thing we want to look at here is just thinking about equilibrium. Uh, so we have this value. So QA, uh, we can we can figure that out. That's just going to increase linearly as our uh, our area uh, for our Q function uh, increases as we we move across. Uh, but our Y1 for this Q function because that doesn't change. That's why we have a linear uh, change there. Uh, and remember. With shear flow, we're looking at really a force. Think of think of shear flow like forces or force per per millimeter. Um, and like I said, it's millimeter into the page. So this value Q B actually has to equal twice uh, Q A. It's because we've got two forces coming in here, um, and that's going to equal two times Q A. And then we've got our Q max. So if we want to determine, so if we can determine what our shear flow distribution is, now we want to take it into a shear stress. Um, the, the two steps we have to do is really, you know, first determine is determine that shear flow. Q equals V Q over I uh, at each of these locations. And then uh, we need to get the stress. And to get the shear stress, all we do is we divide by the thickness. Um, by the thickness T. So, you know, that will give us tau equals Q, our shear flow, divided by T, which is really the same as VQ over IT. So you can see that our, our shear flow equation really hasn't changed. Uh, our shear stress equation really hasn't changed. The only, only thing that really is changing uh, from, you know, how we calculated our shear stress uh, previously uh, to how we're doing it with our shear flow is really how we're treating the flanges um, and, and how that value Q uh, is dealt with there. So um, with that, I guess let's let's uh, jump into it and uh, work with some numbers here. So let's start um, in the flange. And we'll we'll draw out our little picture. of kind of the uh, uh, the portion that we are going to be looking at. So we're going to be looking um, really right at uh, halfway. So that's going to be, 75 millimeters, uh, the thickness of our flange is 20 millimeters, and the distance uh, from the centroid uh, to the extreme fiber is 200 millimeters. Um, Again, the area that we're looking at. So we're going to be determining our shear flow right at this portion uh, uh, right here at the uh, the middle of the section, uh, but only in the flange. So um, this shaded in portion, uh, that's going to be our A1. And then we have the centroid of that, uh, the distance between uh, the centroid of this section A1 to the centroid of our section is Y1. So our shear flow is, um, which we found out you know, previously, we're starting at zero here, and we're just going to increase linearly as we go. So 
and you know that distance is going to be seventy five um, and again we have a shear flow direction here and we'll just call that um, you know value uh, right here uh, at the the edge remember this a one is coming uh, right into the middle um, that value we'll just call uh, QA. So uh, let's work that out. So um, QA equals V times Q over I. Um, our Q, remember, is A1 times Y1. Y1 is just going to be... Um, this distance here, so we have 200. Centroid uh, is halfway between 20, so that's going to be uh, 190. So Y1 just equals 200 minus 20 divided by 2. Y1 equals 190 millimeters. And then uh, A1 is just going to be 20 millimeters uh, times 75. And if you calculate that out, uh, you get that A1 equals uh, 1,500 millimeters squared. So uh, if we plug uh, these two numbers into our Q uh, to find out what our uh, shear flow uh, magnitude is at, uh, at A, uh, we get 80,000 newtons times 190 times 1500 divided by 2.75 times 10 to the eighth millimeters to the fourth that's just our value of I and we find that um, QA equals 82.9 newtons per millimeter. If we want to find out what the shear stress is there, um, again, we're just going to divide by the thickness of the material. Um, so tau equals QA over T flange equals 82.9 newtons per millimeter divided by 20 millimeters we get tau equals 4.14 MPA. And remember that we found that, um, you know, in our, in our previous, our no numbers example, that due to symmetry, this value QA is going to be the same uh, for each of these flanges. And that makes sense too, because you have the same distance uh, from the neutral axis to the area A1, and you have the same A1. So the Q doesn't change, the applied load doesn't change, uh, the moment of inertia doesn't change, and that's why we get a distribution uh, that looks like this. All right, well, that's our, that's our first one. Now uh, let's look at uh, the area just um, at the top of the web. So we'll look. So the shear flow at the top of the web, um, and we'll call that just, you know, QB, uh, just to be consistent with uh, this value here. So uh, what's, our, what's our image look like? Well, it's 
pretty much going to be just um, you know our area that's participating in this is just going to be this top flange. Remember, we're looking uh, really at the shear flow right at this location here. And that's going to be oh, 150 millimeters. Two hundred, two hundred, A one, and then that centroids there. We have this distance Y one. So remember how I said that the shear flow uh, at the top of the web has to be twice what it is um, in the flanges. Uh, so I showed you this um, this here. So uh, I'll show you just a, a quick way to think about that, which is maybe a little bit different than how we've drawn it so far. And it's to think of it a little bit more like a, a shear force diagram. So we have been drawing our shear flow. Uh, and then we'll just, we have been drawing our shear flow diagram like this, um, there you go. And there's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but what, uh, and, and a lot of textbooks draw it this way. Um, but we can think about it. Also as drawn this way, where um, this is really, you know, having the fact where we, just like a, a shear force diagram, uh, the image on the right kind of shows us our, um, you know, we, we have a shear flow which is positive to the right, um, while here it's kind of more the absolute value. Both are correct, but the, the reason that I like uh, sort of drawing this is, well, if this value is QA, and this value is QA, it shows you right away that QB is twice of QA. Um, so this is sort of, you know, drawn as a, a, as in, absolute shear. And this uh, flow, and so it's absolute value. Uh, that's probably better. And this is uh, drawn with um, a shear flow, which is positive to the right. And as I said, both both are, are uh, correct. A lot of textbooks draw it this way. Um, but the nice thing here is that if you think about this as really just a magnitude of forces, uh, you can see that this value here is going to make a lot of sense of why uh, that shear flow has to be um, uh, twice of what those flanges are coming in. So let's work out uh what our what our shear flow is here uh, right at the top so um q equals v q over i and that's just going to be 80,000 times 190 same y1 as above um times 20 times 150 so thickness of the flange times its width for the A1, and that's 2.75 times 10 to the eighth. So again, that's Y1, A1. And we get a Q 
equal to 165.8 newtons per millimeter. And in fact, if you divide that by two, you get 82.9. So, you know, that's, that's a good check, and that makes sense, because you, you know, those forces all have to cancel each other out. Um, we've got just good confirmation that our, our numbers are uh, doing what they're supposed to do. Um, now, if we just work out what our shear stress is, uh, it's just going to be Q divided by T, uh, and we see our classic VQ over IT, and it's going to be 165.8 newtons per millimeters. But again, the T that we're looking for here, because we're looking at the shear in the web, that's 15 millimeters. So we'll divide that by 15. And we get tau equals 11.1 MPA. Now this is really interesting. That's, uh, that is the exact same value that we got uh, when we looked at our, you know, how our shear stress distribution with our, our previous uh, tau, where we just uh, brought our Q coming down from the top to the bottom, and we didn't bother about coming in from the flanges. We got 11.1 .1 MPA, so we're getting the exact same thing uh, when we deal with our shear stress in, in this way. And again, that should make sense, because if we, we draw up uh, sort of the, the diagram of what's going on, with our um, shear stress, and let's just call that, you know, say that's one millimeter long. Uh, remember, so these horizontal forces, because they're equal and opposite, they're gonna cancel out, and so the only forces left um, to resist are the bending. Uh, the out of out of balance bending forces, um, which is the whole reason why we have shear in the first place. So if we say that's F plus DF, and there's going to be another bending stress over here. And the resultant of that is F. Well, this shear force over one, so the, the magnitude of all of that is just going to be 165.8 newtons per, you know, one millimeter. So, and this is all exactly the same as how we originally derived our uh, shear stress distribution. So, while we're doing, you know, slightly different things with the shear flow, it's really only the flanges which are changing. You know, so far all we've seen is in the web, uh, everything is, is the same. So, uh, let's just do that for completeness. Let's just look at what our maximum shear stress is. Uh, we know the top and the bottom are going to be the same because of symmetry. And so let's just look at the shear flow at the neutral axis. So, drawing out our section here. And 
So we know that we've got, you know, A1 web, A1 flange, Y1 web, Y1 in the flange. So let's just work out uh, what our shear flow is really quick. So Q equals V Q over I. Um, our Q is just going to be the sum of our A1 times Y1. And that's going to equal, so that's 20 millimeters, 15 millimeters for the web. Uh, we're just going to get 20 times 150, and that's A1 flange times 190, and that's Y1 flange plus 15 times uh, 200 minus 20 is 180, and that's A1 web. Uh, 180 divided by 2 to get our centroid distance is 90 and that's y1 in the web. So we end up, we multiply all of that out, we end up with q equals 813,000 millimeters cubed and so we can plug that in. Q equals 80,000 times 813, 1, 2, 3, divided by 2.75 times 10 to the 8th. And you work all of that out, you get Q equals 236.5 newtons. Per millimeter and we'll just work out our shear stress uh, Q over T uh, remember the T here is going to be for the web and we just get 236.5 divided by 15 tau equals 15.8 MPA uh, which again is kind of exactly what we had uh, previously so, 15.8 MPA as tau max. And that should make sense because the, um, the distribution that we have, well, this you know, big Q is the same. So, uh, we'll just, we'll go through, we'll just draw, just draw out what the, the two distributions look like, uh, just for completeness, just so we can see the differences. So... And if this is going to be our, uh, call it thick wall, assumption, and we'll just draw our uh, various portions on there. tau max, and that's going to equal 15.8 MPA, this was 11.1, .1. that's 1.1, that's 11.1, that's 1.10. Now we'll draw our uh, thin-walled assumption. And I'll do my, my best to try to get a, a similar looking drawing here. It's not my, not my best uh, eye sections, but uh, that'll be okay. Um, 
and the centroid uh, again we'll just we'll draw the um, the vertical portion uh, out here but just know that it's going to act uh, right along in the middle uh, actually we might be able to actually well we'll do it this way um, so acting um, along the center line of the flange uh, our flange stress comes up and it comes down and that's 4.14 MPA um, and then it does the opposite on the other side of the neutral axis again that's 4.14 MPA uh, and then in the middle here our shear stress is going to be 11.1 .1 MPA and then at the neutral axis uh, tau max equals 15.8 MPA and this is 11.1 .1 MPA and this is our thin walled assumption so uh, this is worth just taking a, a brief uh, look at you know why did we why 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 have I bothered to teach you two two different methods of um, of shear distribution so you know for the um, where well you say tau max is the same in both um, the shear actually the shear in and all the shear stress distribution in the web hasn't changed. I mean, it's a apologize for a bad drawing over here, but it's really it's the same. 11.1 .1 MPA uh, right at the top of the web, and the same tau max. And it's the same parabolic uh, distribution. The only thing that's changed is well, we we have increased um, the shear stress, uh, you know, in the in the flanges by you know, a factor of about four. But it's still relatively low, um, and so well that might be a, a, an issue if we need to do a welded section. But it's only an issue if we're doing a welded section where we're welding uh, the flange, uh, you know, here or here. Most of the time, well, we would put a flat plate on here, and then we put our weld in there, and so we'd be working with the eleven point one MPA. So I was like, well, why would we do this? And it doesn't become really apparent. And this is why, uh, for while this sort of thick walled assumption is not a you know not correct uh, for the flanges for de for design, we often use it because well the we're interested in maximum shear, um, and so you know it's what's in the web makes a lot more sense. Or if we're trying to weld up this section, we care about you know shearing. Uh, at uh, at this plane here, or at this plane here, uh, not at the web. So, as for design, that's why we use this uh, so often. But the reason why this becomes apparent uh, is makes a lot more sense when um, we look at the uh, resultant forces uh, here instead of stresses, and that's going to be what we're going to look at in the next video. So, uh, like I said, um, it, it, it's interesting to see. We can, we can work out the shear flow um, and, and look at what the shear stresses are. We can see that for uh, the, the webs of these eye sections, nothing really changes. But it's really, uh, we want to look at the, um, so, stresses. Don't really change. But resultant can cause an issue. Um, 
And so that's what we're going to look at uh, in, in the next video. should be a really brief video. But it's really, you know, um, this, you know, stress block here, uh, if, we, if we integrate uh, over that stress and we look at, well, what's the resultant force pushing this way, pushing this way, here, here, uh, and pushing up, well, what changes? And, and do we create any instabilities? Um, and so that's going to be the little teaser uh, leading in. Uh, so, but that's it. That's, uh, so you can see the, uh, shear flow stuff is, is not that, um, scary. Uh, we can just sort of work through it uh, the same way. It really, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward equation. It's just this VQ over I, uh, our, our only fun is, is determining Q. And, um, also in just, uh, we, we know that our, our rules of, if we've got a horizontal mem, so this is, if we're loading, uh, in an axis of symmetry uh, on the principal axes, um, then we know that uh, our horizontal members will go uh, will vary linearly, and our vertical members will vary parabolically. So with that, we're going to wrap this video, and then we'll do another uh, brief one looking at um, this bit here, where uh, you know these resultant forces, and what does that mean for the stability? Um, of the uh, of the section. So thank you very much.